Hi, everybody. My name is Jen Wagman, and I am the founder and president of Jen Vets uh, Incorporated. Uh, this is a new veteran service organization, and you've heard of Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z. This is Gen Vet. And so now you've heard of that. Uh, this is a new podcast, so welcome. And it will be uh, every fourth Wednesday of the month at uh, 6 Central and 7 Eastern Time. And so I thought I would start uh, this month, this uh, Wednesday, by talking a little bit about myself and what Gen Bats is about. And I wanted to do that because really uh, what Gen Bats is, is about me connecting with veterans and our military community and the organization really connecting with veterans and the military community one-on-one -on -one and getting to know and understand individuals. Uh, I believe that the biggest problem that we have among the communities isn't so much of a problem with lack of resources, um, you know, a problem with the quality of resources, a quality of things that are out there. It is a miscommunication and perception problem. And honestly, I think of all the problems to have, that is a good one because it's something that as a community we can fix. And it's something that I believe that I am in a good position to help be an ombudsman for, a uh, bridge for. And I have a lot of experience in this uh, space um, to do that. So I wanted to spend some time with you today, tonight, um, explaining who I am and what my experience is in this area. And uh, so you get a little bit to know about me and to trust who I am and what that experience is and a little bit of flavor for my personality. Um, I'm not sure if that's gonna be a good thing at the end of the night. If you were to ask my friends and family, they would probably say, Jen, maybe you don't wanna do that, but I I'm gonna go ahead and um, take a risk on that. Uh, I would like to start by saying I spent the last uh, 24, 36 hours at a uh, a meeting, uh, a, a forum called Military uh, Thriving Change Forum. And Kevin Schmeagel and his wife are the uh, people who put this on. And it was um, a, a forum where business leaders and veteran service organizations came together to sort of put their heads together and talk about all of these issues that I'm talking with you about now, things that are out there, um, what, are in, what are the things that are inhibiting uh, progress uh, within the veteran community, within the active duty, duty com uh, community, whether it's recruiting um, our, our forces, uh, young people to join, whether it's transitioning services, when veterans um, active duty are coming to be veterans, what is, uh, what is the problem with getting people to be um, adequately employed, um, and then problems within the veteran community. And it was amazing. Uh, Kevin and, and his wife what they did in this period of time was just phenomenal. I, I was I felt so blessed to be a part of this and to be part of that change making uh, group. Um, and it was just the first of many. And and the sponsors, Wells Fargo, actually stepped up tonight and and said I think they surprised Kevin by saying they're going to sponsor another four uh, next year so that we can continue to get together as uh, groups and and do this. And so. I tell you this because there are people that are out there actively trying to solve some of the problems that I get, some of the issues um, and real concerns that over the last 23 years that I've been doing this, when my clients come to me, when my veterans come to me, when those who are still actively serving say, Jen, there are real problems out here nobody's listening. They're waiting for us to die. They don't care. Um, VA sucks. I hear that all the time. I've, I've, I've said that before. And for a long time, I, you know, even having worked for VA, and I'll tell you about a little bit about that in a second, I, I was inclined to agree. Um, but over the last five or six years in particular, having worked so closely uh, with VA uh, through my prior service organization, Paralyzed Veterans of America, 
I started to build relationships and understand how much was work, work has been going into individual programs that come out of VA, that come out of different uh, service organizations, nonprofits, profits. And what I really understand is that the information that they are giving out or that they are that they think they're giving out and that they're getting to you all as veterans um, and active duty families isn't what they think they're getting to you. And what you're hearing isn't what they're saying. Um, and and that's a that's a big problem because the stuff that they have is stuff that you want, but you, you're not understanding that or they're not delivering it right. And a lot of them are veterans. A, a good portion of them are veterans. So I think that that miscommunication, that problem right there is something that we really need to consider. And one of the things that I've learned um, that is missing, that's something that I think that if we have the right tools in place, if we have the right um, forum for, for us to be able to provide this information to you in the right way, we need someone who is going to actually listen, who is going to get to know uh, individuals, um, individual families, veterans, active duty, however that is going to happen, um, to understand what your story is, what your individual circumstances, not to just slough you off to, um, and I'm, I'm not implying, by the way, that any individual, to include VA, intends to slough anybody off, because I don't think that they do, but they are such a big organization, and some of the uh, larger veteran service organizations are also large and overwhelmed, that that's what ends up hap happening effectively. Um, there are so many different arms and branches, and they don't talk to each other, not because they, they don't care, but they're prohibited by... Uh, privacy laws, HIPAA, um, they can't, they can't, and they're not designed to. Um, as I've said before, VA is the largest uh, government agency. It has so many regulations in place, and they can't be expected to sit and do what I want to do, what I'm really good at, and what I get made fun of all the time is I like to sit and talk and listen, and I want to get to know individuals and their stories. So when I get a client, I will sit and I will talk 15, 20 minutes. And what I've been shocked to learn is that a lot of you, no one's listened. No one's actually heard what your story is and to understand what it is that you need, what it is that um, holistically, not just what one issue is. So when you maybe make a phone call uh, to, to VA or to a hotline and uh, you get one answer and maybe it's not even the right answer. Maybe you get bad information. That would piss me off too. And I wouldn't trust VA uh, if I got one bad answer that led me astray. But the truth of the matter is one bad answer doesn't actually, shouldn't actually ruin the whole agency for you because there's so much good that comes out of there. There are so many different programs and resources. What we need is someone an organization, whether it's one person, to actually be able to guide to different areas and the right and provide that right information for you. And so what we do is translate, navigate, and actually provide those sorts of information for you um, to be able to do that. So, you know, I started back in, after 9-11 uh, with the pro bono consortium. I then went to um, to work for VA, uh, the Board of Veterans Appeals, and I did that for a while. Um, and I, I learned a, a lot while I was working there. Um, and then went to work for Paralyzed Veterans of America, where I spent a long time um, in general counsel's office. I practiced in the private sector, and I've also done a lot of volunteer work in my own community where I've had the opportunity to work with um, a wide variety of um, different groups of veterans and active duty uh, military and their families. And I think I understand for me personally, uh, the mission when I started Gen Vets uh, was to address the, the families as well as 
the veterans themselves. I think that there has been a lot that's changed over the course of the last 20, 30 years in terms of our, our veterans and what their needs are. But this service organization also covers what I like to say are all the greatest generations because we hear about the great the greatest generation, but there are a lot of great generations. And so that's what I aim to serve. Um, and you know, for everything from uh, appeals and claims um, to pushing for change and legislation and things that we think that are necessary because it's stuff that I want to hear from you and that you're, you come to me with. And, and, um, those are things that I, I would like the conversation to be, um, something that continues to go on, uh, uh, you know, between you and me and the organization, whether it's you reaching out, um, by this podcast or through the website, um, that's, that's how that this should work. Uh, so that's a that's a lot about um, my personal background and and how this started. Um, something else that came up today uh, that really, you know, from where I start, um, I thought was really interesting um, was the phrase "If not me, then who?" Um, and if not now, then when? Uh, that's sort of always been the the mantra by which I've lived my life, um, probably to the chagrin of all my family, um, my four kids included, uh, I tend to a cause comes on and and I see somebody who uh, hasn't been treated right, um, an issue that needs to be taken on, I cannot sit and let it let it go. I, it, it is something that it is ingrained upon me that I have to do something about it. And I don't remember the first time that I actually heard that phrase, but I'm pretty sure it was in elementary school. And it, it just, it spoke to me and it is pretty much how I have um, taken on everything uh, since then. And when it comes to how I move forward um, with with this, with my work with veterans, um, that's how I think that this needs to be done. And the conversations that we will have on this podcast and everything moving forward that generates from this podcast, whether it's once a week or more than that, um, when for next week, you'll see me again, uh, there, I'll get to that in a few minutes, but there, there will be an opportunity, um, to do more than just once a week. Um, all of the things that we talk about are the issues are born from that are they're They're born from things that I think are so important that that need to be addressed. There'll never be anything that I shy away from. So you want to talk to some about something, you have an issue that needs to be addressed or a question you want answered, please ask it. Come to me. Don't be afraid. Um, you can ask something that is on the uh in the chat live while while we're doing this, or send me a message on the website. Um, if I don't address it on a podcast, I'll write about it and and put it on the website. That's how I want to handle this. Because if I can't represent you or I can't do something for you or you don't want to do it publicly, I will absolutely interact with you or, or answer something so that everybody can have the answer um, online and interact with you that way. Because that's the voice that I want to to be. I want to be able to provide answers to everybody or address issues. And I have the ability to communicate with people that are in the nonprofit world that are at VA um, in a way that maybe not everybody in the veteran space in the active duty space does. So uh, use me and allow me to be able to be that voice for you and um, know that that is something that I can do. I, I can talk for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour straight without taking a breath. If you challenge me to do it, I'll do it. Ask my family. It is something that um, you have to practice. 
without taking a breath. Um, done it a lot. So that's me. Um, I would say that in addressing some of these questions, uh, one of the things you should also know about me is that I believe wholeheartedly that everybody should have an opportunity to speak uh, without without throwing, as I've said before, also sand at each other. I don't believe that um, this would be a, an appropriate for, forum um, for people to get on and, uh, you know, Yes, uh, you, you think VA sucks, you think a nonprofit sucks, you think the service organization sucks. Are we moving a ball forward if that is uh, what we're doing when we, when we bring these people together? I think that the solution at this point is to allow everybody to talk, pose your questions, ask me things, let me give you my perspective on things because my perspective is born of many, many, many years of uh, of experience and dealing with the people that run these organizations and the agency. And I'm not going to bullshit you. And that's the other thing you should know, because the language is uh, something that my father would say, oh, Jennifer, you just made a huge mistake. Um, this is probably why I am in the right field, uh, because when I was when I was uh, starting out, I, I, I was told you curse like a sailor. Um, then I, I grew up, I was born on Edwards Air Force Base, then to Travis, and then my dad was transferred to Andrews Air Force Base. Then we moved and they bought a house near Montclair, Virginia, or in Montclair, Virginia, which is so close to Quantico, a Marine base. And I didn't appreciate how awesome that was and the scenery around that until I was 17 years old. My dad did not appreciate the scenery like I did. He still doesn't. But 17 years old, when I worked at the exchange and on the seven day store, I was in heaven. And there was a lot of cursing there too. So between the Navy and the Marine Corps, and then learning the army when I was in college and my girlfriends were dating West Point boys, I'm pretty sure I'm in the right area um, to use this language and to fit in. And I understand from all my clients now that nobody trusts lawyers, um, especially ones that don't speak um, the way that they do. So I feel like if I drop a bad word here and there when I'm actually just talking, you should know that um, that's it's because it's professional, right? This is the language we all use. So I think contrary to my father as well. I am speaking professionally when I use a word or two that is outside the scope of a normal um, professional point of view and that you should trust me more because that is what happens. So that's also, I'm going to throw that out there. You should never, never trust a lawyer who doesn't use a bad word once in a while. And uh, you can tell um, Tom Markevich if he disagrees, he should write into the chat or call in or, or, or something like that. That's his name. I'll give you his email address too if you want to. Because um, I'm, I'm 50 years old now and he'll still tell me uh, what he thinks and uses the red pen as well. But I will um, I will tell you what I think uh, using, using the words. And if I think that there is something, if I don't agree with VA on something, I will respectfully tell I, I will, I'll give my opinion and I'll go to them and I'll say, this is what we think. This is why. And we can have that discussion, but I won't do it disrespectfully because there are things that need to change. There are things that we can discuss, obviously. And the same goes for the veteran service organizations. Um, and that brings my me to, I, I do have a couple questions that um, were asked of me ahead of time. Um, and one of them was, was just that. Um, about VA. Um, let me find this really quickly because I want to, I, I got this fancy uh, notebook. Um, I don't know if you can see this, probably not because of the funny stuff, but uh, where you, you write everything down and it types for you. Um, 
but moving the pages along, it's it's a little bit difficult. So what is it when it comes to talking to the VA? Okay, so what can be done? For many of us, it feels like VA's first response is always to deny our claims. And this client wants to know, when filing an initial VA claim, should veterans immediately engage an attorney or is it better to start with a veteran service organization or a VSO, um, a national service officer? It seems that VSOs are overwhelmed and while they certainly want to help, they struggle to represent veterans fully. I've heard great things about DAV from my friends. So what I was saying is that VA is um, overwhelmed. Um, and so I, I, I will say that, yeah, there, there's a lot going on and I don't have a problem going back and talking about it, um, even though, you know, I'm telling you, I don't think they suck. I, that there's a million um, reasons why I don't think they suck. But do I understand that there are problems coming out um, and that you've had issues with them and that very specific ones? Yes, I get that. And I understand the Board of Veterans Appeals and, and all of the appellate process, process. You're waiting six, seven, eight, sometimes 10 years for decisions. It's unacceptable on every level. I know. But there are other things too. Th th those are those are small. It's not small when you're the one who's dealing with it. But that is one department. That is one area in otherwise a very big, very big um, organization. And so what I'm saying is because that's the one thing you're dealing with. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that that's more my point. So if you can stick with me, if you can listen and and understand that we can talk about more and and we can make change we can we can discuss things that um i can give you more and you can give me more and talk to me and we can work together to get some of this information and i can help you understand how to get things done differently between va and you and service organizations and you differently if we just have these conversations and I can help you understand. To answer this question, if I were to talk to any of my people in the service organizations, they would say, no, we." I shouldn't put words in, but I've had the conversation where I've said, do you, do you feel that it's true that, that lawyers aren't needed, the private law firms, aren't needed and that um, even in even in the circumstances where they're a little bit more complicated. And I've heard them say, no, we've got it under control. I don't agree with that. I don't agree that lawyers are needed in every, um, in every, first of all, you never have a lawyer file a claim. Never, ever, ever. Okay. The lawyers are not allowed to file claims for you, period. Uh, you have a service organization help you. Um, we will do it at GenVets. Every single organization, service organization out there will do it for you. Paralyzed Veterans of America, American Legion, Disabled American Veterans. I mean, if, if you want a list of them, I, I'll give it to you. But all of your state and county service organizations will do it. You don't need a lawyer to file a claim. And any good lawyer will tell you when they look at something that's been denied, you most of the time you don't need a lawyer for a gen, uh, just to, to appeal something if you need to. It's only when things get complicated that you might need a lawyer. And even when I'm practicing law and I, I'll get a call from VA, my name's up on the list as someone who would accept clients, not through GenVets as a pro bono um, client. I would never take a case if I look at it and I don't, why you don't charge. There are law firms out there that will, but I don't believe in charging a veteran for something that doesn't require real work. Um, so no, um, I don't. I don't think it's better to engage an attorney without going to a VSO first. Now, I also believe it's incumbent upon VSOs to say, 
look, this is a little complicated. Um, you may want to consider because we are overwhelmed. That's part of the partnership I'm talking about. And that's sort of where I believe we need to sit down. I've said this for a long time, sit down at the table and come up with community standards. That's between lawyers, pri the private bar and VSOs and say, this is when, and this is when not. And until we do that, you're going to have bad actors out there who take advantage. And then we're going to have the sharks that are out there. And, and they're, like I said, you never pay anyone to file a claim. And there are people out there who are not lawyers that are out there charging money for claims and for toward future benefits. You should never be signing anything about, toward your future benefits. It, if you're if you're signing an, an engagement letter uh, with someone, it should be part of whatever retro you receive. And that's it. There should be nothing future. You don't sign away anything that, you know, part of your disability. Um, and if anyone ever has questions about what is good and not good about what you think you might be signing, that's what I'm here for. You can email me. You can uh, go to genvets.org, www.genvets.org. You you email me personally, and I will answer that question for you as to whether or not you're, you're getting... Um, I don't even know though. I'm not going to use a bad word here, but bamboozled. Um, isn't that a friend's? That's a friend's reference. But yeah, no, you don't, you don't do that. So I do think that there is a point where we all need to sit down and come up with something that is reasonable for you all to understand when is good and when is not. But the majority of times, no, a VSO is, is what you need. And that's it. But there are times when it gets complicated, when you've been denied and maybe you need a medical opinion. You do need evidence that is going to push you over. And more and more, some of the opinions that are coming out of VA, um, you know, they're just you're not you can't fight them. Um, and until we do something about the medical opinions uh, and, and the quality, uh, it's tough. And that's the unfortunate truth. And that's a whole nother podcast, which I'm happy to do. Uh, the next question I had is, you know, with data showing that 72% of women's MST claims are approved, only 57% of men's claims make it through. Why does it seem so much harder for male veterans to have their experiences acknowledged by the VA. One client said he was denied three times. He said each time it feels like no one is listening or cares about the struggles he faces as a veteran. And he said, um, you know, for many of us, it feels like it's VA's first response to deny. Uh, you know, I think that that is how everybody feels that their first response is to deny. To deny. I, I don't dispute that. I don't think the quality uh, at the low level is as good as you get going up. I think that the inexperience um, of the rating raters um, is an issue right now. Um, they're, they're, the percentage of new people that are being trained and what their level is, is an issue. And I don't think anybody would deny that at, at VA either. There's a turnover. There are so many new claims. There's so many more veterans filing claims. I will say this on the part of veterans, listen to your VSOs. When you are filing claims, if you don't have the evidence yet, don't file the claim yet. You, you shouldn't just be filing claims because, oh, throw it in there, throw everything in this, uh, the Welcome kitchen sink because you're you're wasting the resources of the agency and you're taking and away from your fellow veterans who do have valid claims at that moment. And you're those are people who are waiting in line and it's not right. So. If you don't have the claim, you don't have the evidence, then wait to file the claim and don't just file because you're, you're throwing darts out there and you're hoping that maybe something will catch. It, it just doesn't work that way. And uh, I think that's a, a, a mentality that I think that VA um, is seeing. And it also sort of lends more to the deny, deny, deny mentality that maybe we think they have. Um, because of that. 
So that's my advice on, on that one. Maybe they have it, but there are a lot of new people that are being trained and that's the way it is.